This morning we begin our study of the subject of creation. And uh, I was hoping to get it all in one week, but that's not going to happen. So we're going to need two weeks to cover this. Uh, I want to start off by reading through the section as written in our Statement of Faith. And uh, as we go through this again, as always, if you have any questions or anything about it, uh, please do point those out. It says, We believe all things were created by God according to the Genesis account in Scripture. Time, space, matter, life, life, uh, sorry, light, life, language, DNA, cells, molecules, natural laws, moral law, and all contained within these give consistent evidence to a starting point and intelligent source. Scientific observation and experimentation have helped us further see the awesomeness of God and his creation. God's divine revelation in scripture accurately records for us what we could not otherwise know, our beginning. God is the source of all creation, and he has a complete plan for all he has made. Any questions on anything in there? Okay. Um, notice how vague it is. Uh, that is intentional. The very first line says, we believe all things were created by God according to the Genesis account of Scripture. Well, uh, there's a lot of different interpretations of the Genesis account in Scripture, as we're going to talk about some today. Um, and that is left intentionally vague. As we've said when we started off uh, our study here, a statement of faith is not meant to say everything that I believe or everything that our church even teaches. Um, rather, a statement of faith simply is, this is what you have to affirm to be a part of our church. And so there is a bit of, you know, uh, there's nothing in there about six literal days, okay? Do I believe in six literal days? Yes. If somebody doesn't believe in six literal days, are they allowed to be a member of our church? Yes. Um, that's one of those issues that we decided is not of such, con uh, it's not of such level of importance nor clarity uh, that we felt it needs to be binding on our members. Um, things about the age of the earth, you know, there's nothing in there about that. Um, so we, we have intentionally left some ambiguities there, and uh, hopefully as we go through this today, I will try to present multiple views of Genesis, including ones that I don't even hold, um, just to kind of show you there are good Christians that believe the Bible, that read the book of Genesis and see things a little bit differently, um, than you may be familiar with. And so we affirm that, and we're not, uh, that's not one of the dividing lines that we've chosen to set in our church. Okay, before we start going through that, let me just recommend a couple of books on this subject. I know I didn't recommend any for the last section uh, on the Holy Spirit. I did read several, but I didn't find any that were overly helpful, so I didn't recommend any. But a couple that I can say about creation. First of all, one is written by a local pastor over in Crown Point. Um, Steve DeWitt, he pastors the Bethel Church there that Catherine and I attended a couple years ago, uh, right before we came here, actually. Um, he wrote a book called Eyes Wide Open, uh, Enjoying God in Everything. And it's a very thoughtful book on how a Christian uh, ought to see God in the beauty of the world. Uh, whether, we're, whether that's looking at a sunset, enjoying a cup of coffee, or whatever, uh, we should enjoy these things as good and beautiful gifts, as an expression of the kindness and beauty of the God who made them. Very interesting book um, and one that I would recommend to you. Next one, more, more on the point of creation specifically, is A Reformed Approach to Science and Scripture by Keith Matheson. Um, it's an introduction to the subject. He's not trying to convince you of anything, uh, a particular viewpoint. He's just providing a framework for how to evaluate uh, things in Genesis. And uh, basically, we'll get into some of the content of that book a little bit later next week, primarily about the age of the universe, but what that book is trying to do is basically advocate that Christians take both scripture and science seriously, uh, as both are true revelations of God, right? We have two ways that God reveals himself, in nature and in scripture, um, and both are true, inerrant, if you want to use that word, revelations of God, um, and so we ought to study both of them, and we ought to have humility enough to question our interpretations of both. Um, when you see a supposed conflict between science and scripture, obviously one of them's wrong. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Not one of them is wrong, but we're interpreting one of them wrong. Okay, so if you see, oh, science seems to suggest this and, and scripture seems to suggest the opposite. Well, the interpretation of one of those two is wrong, and it could be scripture. It could be we're reading scripture wrong. Uh, we'll get into this some next week, but for instance, um, Historically speaking, one of the most famous examples of this was geocentricity. 
Uh, Christians for a long time believed that the earth was the center of the universe. Everything was moving around us. Uh, Copernicus came along and said, no, I think the sun is actually the center of the universe. We're moving around it. And some Christians said, well, no, the Bible says the sun rises in the east. The Bible, you know, uh, God made the sun stand still, right, when Joshua was fighting Amalek. Um, and so they interpreted those, those passages to mean that the sun is what's moving. Well, no Christians today believe that pretty much. We all understand from science that, well, yeah, the sun is, is stationary. The earth is what's moving. Um, and yet that just shows that sometimes when we have a dogmatic, literal interpretation of Scripture that is unquestioned, and science comes along and says, well, wait a minute, this seems to be suggesting the opposite. It's a good idea to question, well, are we interpreting this properly? Uh, is this possible that we're just taking something as a literal scientific fact that really wasn't meant to be that at all? Because obviously, you know, to Joshua's eye, as he's fighting, it did look like the, st the sun stood still. That doesn't mean God's making some sort of argument there that the sun is what's moving and the earth is stationary. So anyways, very uh, well-written book, uh, very thought-provoking for me, uh, a reformed approach to science and scripture, uh, if you're interested in those subjects further. Okay, <clears throat> I want to sketch out for you where we're headed as you approach the subject of creation. Uh, there's a lot of related subjects to address here, and so I had to really think about how to structure this. Uh, we're going to look at creation in terms of what, how, when, why, and why it matters. So the very first thing we're going to cover this morning is what, meaning what we believe about creation. Uh, and the answer is pretty simple on that one, that God created all things. Uh, that's the first affirmation of our doctrinal statement on this point because it is the most foundational point. Next, we'll talk about how God created all things. Uh, we'll talk about theistic evolution, well, was it six literal days, what about the day-age theory, and so on, all of those sort of controversial interpretations. Uh, then we'll get into when, when creation took place, talking about the age of the universe and how to think about these matters when science, again, seems to suggest a universe that is billions of years old, and scripture seems to suggest a universe that is maybe thousands of years old. Uh, so what do we do with that? Uh, then we'll talk about why God created. What was the purpose and the intent of all that God has made? And finally, we'll wrap up with why it matters. Uh, why does it matter for us as Christians, this subject of creation, uh, some practical thoughts and implications of creation? Okay, so that's where we're headed for the next couple of weeks. To begin, what? Uh, let's talk briefly about what is the most important and foundational and also the most clear of all the points in Scripture, namely the fact that all things were made by God. Uh, this is the point in our doctrinal statement that we are dogmatic on. Okay, we can disagree about the how and the when of creation, but we cannot disagree on the who, uh, or simply we are just rejecting Scripture at that point. Uh, the Bible makes perfectly clear throughout the Old and New Testament that all things were created by God. I've chosen six texts to prove this, spanning from Genesis all the way to Revelation, First of all, Genesis 1.1, right? You would expect me to start there. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Nehemiah 9.6, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heavens of heavens, uh, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Uh, Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Uh, Acts 4, verse 24, when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Uh, Ephesians 3, verse 8, to me, though I was the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the, uh, the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. And then finally, Revelation 4.11, Worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Okay, so those are pretty clear texts that God created everything. Everything in the heavens, everything in the earth, everything in the seas, God created it all. Uh, this is the primary thing that God wants to communicate to his people about creation. He hasn't given us all of the answers about when and how, but he has told us repeatedly that he alone is the source of all that exists. Uh, God pre-exists all created things. 
Uh, you saw that back in, in Psalm 90 when it says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. So God, crea- God, God existed prior to everything. He is before all things, and he is the creator of all things. And so the Bible then absolutely rejects the idea of pantheism, that multiple gods created the universe. The Bible also rejects naturalism, uh, the idea that everything came about simply by means of natural selection or the evolutionary process. Uh, We'll talk more about theistic evolution later, which is kind of the idea that God started the evolutionary process, and uh, that was the mechanism through which he created all things. We'll talk about that in a moment. I don't believe that at all, uh, but that is different than naturalism, which cuts God completely out and says everything just came about on its own. Um, The clear teaching of the Bible is that there was a time before creation, and God alone existed at that time, and he alone created all that now exists. Okay, let's get into the how of creation. I assume there's no questions on that point, that God created all things. I think we can all uh, see that fairly clearly in Scripture. Uh, Let's get to the how. Uh, Before we get into specific questions or theories, if you have a Bible, please do turn to Genesis 1. We're going to walk through uh, much of this chapter. I think uh, really this is where you have to start before you start throwing up all these different uh, theories about how. we got to start with what does Scripture teach us right in the very first pages of of the Bible about how God created things. And then we can try to uh, figure out if our theories fit and map on to what Scripture clearly says. So we're going to start with Genesis 1. I did not put these verses up on the screen, so if you have a Bible, uh, please do turn there. We'll read through uh, pretty much all of chapter 1 and maybe a few verses into chapter 2. I'll draw your attention to a few details as we go. Genesis 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there's the affirmation right at the start. The earth was without form and void, And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now you have to stop at this point and recognize that verse 2 comes before the rest. Okay, This is prior to the six days of creation. There's already an earth. It's formless and void. There's apparently water all over the earth, and it's dark. Okay, so And people ask, well, where did all of that come from? Uh, Who made the empty earth with the water all over it? When was that created? Uh, And I'll just point out here, there is some debate about how to interpret verse (laughs) 1. Isn't that crazy? We get one verse into the Bible, and there's already debate uh, among Christians about how to interpret it. But uh, some would view verse 1 as a summary of what's to come in the rest of the chapter. So verse 1 basically would be saying, God created everything, and then the rest of the chapter says, here's how he did it. Okay, Um, That's one view which views verse 1 as a summary introduction to all that follows the six days of creation. Others would view verse 1 as a statement of fact that precedes the six days of creation. Uh, and just analyzing the grammar of the text as I, as I would any other passage that I study, I have to say I find this to be a very compelling argument. Um, so this view would see verse 1 as, God created the heavens and the earth, and then at some later point in time, he came to the earth that he had created previously. It was sitting vacant. It was covered in water. And then he says, let there be light. And so the six days of creation uh, are later than the actual... In other words, it's basically viewing the six days of creation really as the six days of formation. Okay, so the earth was already created in verse 1. God created the heavens and the earth. Then he comes to that earth at some... There's a, a gap of time there. We don't know what it is. Could be right away. It could be a long period of time in between when he created and when he formed it. Um, But again, just notice verse 2, prior to the six days of creation. You know, when he he separates the waters from the waters, it doesn't say he created the water. It was already there. So so he had to create that prior to the the six days. Um, So he created the heavens, uh, he created the universe, the heavens and the earth, And then after a time had passed, he comes to the planet Earth and begins to make it able to produce and sustain life. Okay, so that's part of the debate there. Those are the two views of Genesis 1-1. Is this a summary of everything, or is this saying God created the heavens and the Earth, and then, verse 2, he comes to that Earth that's formless and void, covered in water, and then, verse 3, here's the six days of formation as he's making it capable of sustaining life. So, anyways. Verse 3, and that that does hold some important... um, 
ramifications for what we're going to talk about next week, which would be the age of the universe. Okay, so if, if that's true, that God created the heavens and the earth, and then later came and formed them and made them sustainable for life, well, then you can see how you have millions of years in between. Because some, some of the things, I'll give you a hint of what's coming next week. Um, starlight, right? The speed of light. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know how far the stars are away. I don't know those statistics. But people have argued, well, with how far away the sun and the stars are, and how long it takes for light to travel to us, we wouldn't even be able to see them if the earth was only 6,000 years old. They're millions of light years away. Um, and so, well, how do you do that? Well, the gap theory, which is basically what I'm explaining here, explains how that could be possible. That God created the heavens and the earth, and then uh, at a later point in time, he comes to the earth that he had already created, forms it, makes it sustainable for life. So that, so that in a sense, the six days of creation may have only been six, 10,000 years ago, but the actual creation of the heavens and, the, and uh, of the universe could have been significantly further back than that. Does that make sense what I'm trying to explain here? Okay. All right, so yeah, that's verse 2 is one of those verses that the really literal six days, 6,000 years, young earth creationists tend to kind of ignore <laughs> verse 2. It's as if verse 1 just says, God created everything, and then he said, let there be light. They just miss, oh, wait a minute, there's already an earth here. It's already covered in water. It's formless and void. You know, I don't know what exactly that means, but uh, there's something there to start with. Um, so it's not like on the first day of creation, God just begins creating out of nothing. Well, no, he already has something there. Um, so anyways, verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good. God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening and the morning the first day. By the way, notice he creates light before the sun, moon, and stars on day 4. That's kind of interesting uh, that the, the light and dark are created prior to sun, moon, and stars. Verse 6, God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. Okay, so he comes to uh, this earth that's covered, again, in water. That's, that's you know, verse 2. There's uh, darkness over the face of the deep. Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the water. So the earth was covered in water, and he separates some of the water, he leaves some of the water there, and he puts some of the water above what's called the expanse. Now, what is that talking about? I remember as a kid reading the King James Version and seeing firmament, and I would just go, what in the world is that? <laughs> I never had any idea uh, what firmament meant, and I asked a few people and never really got a good answer. Uh, whatever this is, the expanse, it apparently has water over it and under it. Okay, So the expanse is in between water. Uh, if you drop down to verse 8, you'll see God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning second day. Okay, so the expanse is called heaven. Now, in the Bible, heaven is used to describe different things. Uh, sometimes heaven means the place of God's presence. Sometimes it means the atmosphere. Sometimes it means space. Uh, so, what is it talking about here? Uh, well, look at verse 20. Just glance down there. God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Okay, so I don't think the expanse that God called heaven means the place of God's presence, what we think of as heaven. It means the sky, okay? Because there's birds flying across the expanse, so this is talking about the sky. Um, now, I, I believe the expanse refers to the space above the earth all the way up to the atmosphere. I think that's what he's talking about there. It's the expanse that separates waters above from waters below. And I take that to mean that God pulled some of the water that was covering the earth in verse 2, and he put it outside of the atmosphere. So originally in creation, there was a water, uh, water that gravity would hold up against the atmosphere of the earth. This is not just my view. Many scientists uh, talk about this theory of a water canopy that would be around the atmosphere, possibly an ice canopy either way. Uh, this would explain not only what's going on here, but also in Noah's flood, right? Where God uh, opens up the windows of heaven, as the King James says. He opens the expanse, and he lets the water from above fall down on the earth for those 40 days. Uh, when it says in Genesis 7, the windows of heaven were opened, right? So, if God created originally uh, the atmosphere with water around it, 
And then in Genesis 7, when the flood comes, you know, pokes a hole in it, lets the water go through. That, would, that could explain what's going on there. Uh, this also may help explain why there's such a difference in lifespans uh, prior to the flood, and, uh, as opposed to after. If you read the gen genealogies in Genesis, you'll see people living for like almost 1,000 years, right? Uh, Adam lived for 930 years. <clears throat> Seth, his son, lived for 912 years. Uh, Methuselah, the oldest person uh, on record, 969 years old when he died. Uh, so the theory is that the water canopy had a greenhouse effect on the earth, uh, which is why people live so long. Plants and animals would grow larger, live longer uh, than what we see today. They would be protected from the sun's radiation. Uh, the earth would be a more humid and warm planet. This also helps explain things like um, woolly mammoths that have been discovered in Siberia with their fur still on them. You go, how's that possible? You know, Siberia is covered in ice and snow, and there's these mammoths that still have their fur on them. Well, uh, if, they, if the entire planet was basically humid and warm, a tropical type of environment prior to the canopy falling, uh, they could have lived all over the, all over the, you know, the earth. And then during the flood, <clears throat> they would have been quickly buried. <clears throat> and uh, as, the, as the climate of the earth changed rapidly since the water canopy wasn't there anymore, uh, they could have been buried in ice quickly before they had time to decompose. All this fits with the Genesis account of creation and the flood. Um, let's see here. Uh, the theory of the, the water canopy also explains, perhaps, uh, some of the differences with dinosaurs and other large animals we see fossils of today. Uh, reptiles continue to grow throughout their, the duration of their life. Okay, so if they <clears throat> lived 10 times longer than they do now, just like the humans apparently lived 10 times longer than they do now, right? Adam lived 1,000 years. Uh, most of us don't even make it to 100. So <clears throat> if the same thing was true of animals, that they had the longer lifespans under the, the water canopy, then it would explain how some of them would be huge creatures back then. Uh, imagine an alligator 10 times the size of, of one that we see today. We would look at its bones and say, that's a dinosaur. Maybe that is. <laughs> um, so... That's my long explanation of what the expanse was. It seems to refer to the sky up to the atmosphere where the waters above were. Uh, and by the way, if you think that's all far-fetched, there are some biblical scholars who simply view the expanse as sky, and they would say the waters above refer to clouds. So that's another possible explanation of what the expanse uh, separating the waters above from below would be. And if you like that view better, we can still be friends. Uh, verse 9, God said, Let the waters under the heavens... Be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So there's waters under the earth, I'm uh, sorry, on the earth, under the expanse. Uh, he says, gather them together in one place, let the dry land be everywhere else. Verse 10, he called the dry land earth. <clears throat> the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Uh, God said, let the earth sprout uh, vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. Notice the phrase, each according to its kind. Uh, plants reproduce according to their kind. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Verse 12. The earth brought forth vegetation, <clears throat> plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. You see the emphasis there of reproducing according to their kind. God keeps saying over and over, this is good, this is good, this is good. Verse 13. Uh, there was evening and morning, <clears throat> there was morning the third day. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser night, uh, light to rule the night and the stars. So the greater light would be the sun, lesser light would be the moon. And he made the stars as well. Verse 17, God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night to separate light from darkness. God saw that it was good. Uh, we're going to come back to this again to talk about the age of the universe and discuss briefly uh, the issues with the speed of light and all of that. But just notice there that God creates the sun, moon, and stars to separate day from night to indicate signs and seasons, days and years. And truly, these lights of the sky... Uh, have been used. This is how humans have tracked time from the very beginning, uh, not just to provide you know warmth and light to the earth, but the fixed nature of the sun, moon, and stars, the predictability of them, have given us a means of tracking time and seasons and even direction. Uh, sailors used 
stars to chart their courses as they would travel. Uh, the most primitive clocks were sundials that used the position of the sun to measure what time of day it was. Uh, the moon has its predictable cycles as well. All of this was designed by God to be ordered and fixed and predictable so that humans could have something uh, to measure time with. Verse 19, there was evening, there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, uh, in which, sorry, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Notice again, according to their kind. The animals, the birds reproduce according to their kind. Verse 22. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And guess what? There it is again. Uh, land animals reproducing according to their kinds. Verse 25, God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds. Do you see an emphasis here? Uh, everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our own image, uh, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every, over, uh, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made, uh, God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created, he, he created them. And God blessed them, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now we're not going to talk too much about man at this point. We have a separate section in our statement of faith on mankind, so we're going to talk more about what it means to be made in God's image and so forth then. But for now, just note that humans clearly are the pinnacle of God's creation. Uh, we are uniquely image bearers of God. We are not like the animals. We are set apart from them. Uh, humans are given dominion over everything on earth to subdue it and to rule over it. And uh, ultimately, as we'll see, everything else was made for us. The sun, moon, and stars that we've already talked about. Uh, the plants, the animals, the dry land, the sea, all of it was made for the benefit of man. Verse 29, God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, every tree with its seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them, a very important phrase there, it was all finished. Uh, and all that lived in them after six days. On the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, of course, God didn't need rest. Uh, God wasn't tired. Rather, it was a rest of satisfaction. God had worked and formed a very good earth, and now he sits back and rests in satisfaction at all that he has made. And of course, obviously, this also sets the pattern in Scripture for the Sabbath, uh, taking one day out of seven to rest. Okay, so that is the account of uh, creation according to Genesis. Let's cover a couple of quick questions. Uh, we'll see how far we get today. First of all, theistic evolution. Uh, what is theistic evolution? Basically, it's the idea that the Bible and Darwinian evolution are both true. Okay, this view basically claims that God created the first matter and he set in place the natural laws of the universe, and then evolution was the tool that he used to bring everything else into existence. All right, so theistic evolution says that the first, you know, single-celled organism God created, and then it reproduced for millions of years and slowly morphed into a tadpole and then a lizard and then a chicken and then a mouse and then, you know, a monkey and then a human and all that. Um, so, but God started the whole process. So theistic evolution tries to appease the world's scientists, and still claim to believe that God created all things, though indirectly. Okay, how would you respond to that? Anything pop in your mind as a right-away objection or red flag to theistic evolution? What's that? Okay. Right. So God, God is still active, and yes. Um, 
I'm not sure that that directly refutes how things were created, but I do understand what you're saying, that a theistic evolution mindset kind of leads to deism, right? That God gets things going and then kind of sits back and his hands off. So I can understand that. But how about anything in Genesis that we just read that would stick out as uh, an objection? Yes. Reproducing according to their kind. I mean, how many times did we read that in Genesis? It seems like God wants us to really get this one, that he created things to reproduce after their kind. And so if you start off with a tadpole and you end up with a human, you are absolutely denying that phrase. Um, it just can't, it can't be compatible with Genesis 1. So yes, that is, I think, the, the number one objection I would have is, um, you know, reproducing according to their kind. Um, and obviously there, there is microevolution, right? There is uh, species, so you can breed dogs and get slightly different dogs, okay? But they're still dogs. <laughs> um, you're never going to breed dogs and get a cat. It just doesn't happen. So we do believe in a certain type of adaptation and microevolution, okay? There is a sense in which that's true. Uh, but that does not mean that, you know, dogs always reproduce dogs and frogs always reproduce frogs. And there's never a crossing of those lines. So there's, there, there can be variation within species, but not within kind, okay? Um, all right, good. After its kind, anything else that comes to mind, especially in Genesis, what we read there? Anything else that sticks out and you say, huh, I don't think that works with theistic evolution? Okay, yep, yep. Yep, so uh, let's look down at verse 7 of chapter 2. Actually, I don't think we read this. The Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. How does that work with evolution? It doesn't say God created this and then it turned into a monkey and then into... No, he says he took dust from the ground, formed a human, and breathed into him the breath of life. Okay, so uh, you really, in my opinion, you just cannot read Genesis 1 and 2 with any honesty and come to this notion of theistic evolution. Uh, notice also verse 19 of chapter 2. Out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field. Okay, out of the ground he formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So the same thing that God said about humans in verse 7, he says about animals in verse 19, that he formed them all. He formed each different beast of the field and birds of the heavens and he brought them to Adam to name them. This was all at once, not over the course of millions of years of mutation. Uh, another issue I have with the theistic evolution is um, it is forced to say that God created the world with suffering and death. Okay, You notice that God says over and over, everything I've made is good. At the end, he, says it's, he looks at it, he says it's very good. Okay, But theistic evolution involves creatures dying and natural selection forcing adaptation, which would mean death and suffering was the very mechanism that God used to create. Uh, rather than what the Bible create, you know, presents death and suffering as the result of sin. Okay, so you understand what I'm saying there, that um, for evolution to be true, you have to have generations dying and the survival of the fittest and then you know, adaptation from there and, and reproduction. So suffering and death, uh, according to theistic evolution, would have to be a part of God's good creation, uh, which I don't see how that could be reconciled. Um, not to mention, obviously, in Genesis 3, you see where suffering and death comes from, which is the fall into sin. So, uh, my view on this, you simply cannot reconcile Darwinian evolution with Scripture. Uh, you have to pick one and throw out the other. This attempt to merge them all together, uh, I don't think makes any sense. Any questions on that or comments? We are out of time here, so that's, I guess that's as far as we'll get. Nothing? All right. Uh, next week, we'll talk about the day-age theory. Was it six literal days? And uh, we'll go on from there.